The International Labor Office and the United Nations Environment Program put out a report not so long ago entitled Working Towards Sustainable Development, Opportunities for Decent Work and Social Inclusion in a Green Economy. Now, this report showed that sustainable development with social inclusion and a transition to a green economy is indispensable. The report published almost four years after the first study by the Green Jobs Initiative lays out a wealth of policy lessons, good practices, successful programs, and it demonstrates that a green economy with more and better jobs, poverty reduction, and social inclusion is both necessary and possible. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andy Lokumalo, and I will be your host this morning as we tackle the big question around job creation or access to economic opportunities in the green economy. Um, we have entitled this Financial Mail Green Economy Dialogues Live uh, around job creation because of the many opportunities some people may see, and we've all seen them, especially around the programs that already are going on in our own country, especially with things like renewable energy, we've seen the economic opportunity. But there is no doubt concerns about whether or not even a just transition into a greener economy may actually lead to a loss of jobs. And how do we make sure that we transition appropriately, especially because we are living in a country that faces the triple challenge of unemployment, inequality, and obviously poverty. This particular financial and green economy in this dialogue live is a partnership with Salam Investments, that's a business school, and specifically the African Energy Leadership Center at the school, the Technology Innovation Agency, and the Small Enterprise Development Agency. And on the back of those sponsors representing those organizations, let me introduce you to our panel this morning from Salam Investments. We've got the Chief Executive of Alternatives at Salam Investments, Mr. Mervyn Shangmugam. And we've also got from the Africa Energy Leadership Center at the Vitz Business School, Mr. Professor Loazi Ngubevana, and also the Acting Executive at the Innovation, for Innovation Abling, rather, at the TIA, that's the Technology Innovation Agency, Mr. Vusis Kosana, and last but not least, from the Small Enterprise Development Agency, because there's a role for small businesses here, we have the acting senior manager responsible for incubation networks, Mr. Malembe Ntweni. Gentlemen, uh, welcome to this particular webinar. We are, all, of course, all together for the next hour or so. I'm very, very honored to have all four of you giving us different perspectives um, on this issue of jobs and the green economy. For everybody that's joining us, of course, you have an opportunity to ask your questions. We have a chat in your, in your you'll see there at the bottom of your screen. That chat room is where you'll be able to post all of your questions. And as we go through the session, I will be picking those questions up and, of course, putting them to the relevant persons. If you have a question specific for an individual, please do say who it is for. Uh, but if it's a generic question, that's not a problem as well. I'm happy to use the powers bestowed upon me to allocate it to the appropriate person. Now, ESG has also become an issue more and more, especially when it comes to allocation of investment capital, something I'm pretty sure Mervyn will touch on. And this, this allocation really has put some clear, clear issues around sustainability, around driving a just transition towards a green economy. But what hasn't really been discussed, at least not at length, is what is the impact on the labor markets? Does it create more or better jobs or are we likely to lose some jobs? What is the big issue? Before we get into all of the detail, let me go around the room and allow the gentlemen to kind of give their own perspectives on this particular theme. Mervyn, I'm going to start with you from Salam Investments. Um, just a quick introduction of your role uh, in the alternative side, how this issue of the green economy plays a big role in your life. I know ESG is a big thing for you, but your own perspectives also on this issue of jobs in the green economy. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Anila, and thank you to all the participants You know, in today's uh, debate. I think it's a very important one for us to have, but let me introduce myself first. My name is Mervyn Shanmigam. I'm the chief executive of the Alternatives Business. Um, and Alternatives Business is a business within Sunlam Investments where we focus on investing both for commercial returns but also for impact you know, uh, intentionally trying to make a difference to society. If you ask anybody in our business, you know, why they wake up in the morning, they'll ask you, they'll tell you it's it's to make a real sustainable difference. 
Now, alternative investments, I mean, the areas in which we deploy capital is across private equity, uh, where we look to impact jobs in real estate, in infrastructure, uh, both globally and locally, where we manage funds for institutional investors across the globe and in South Africa. And, and also in, in, uh, in private credit, where we focus mainly on, um, on financing SME, SMEs in the economy. You know, we saw many SMEs being impacted through COVID. Uh, we found wonderful opportunities of businesses looking to survive. And we were very happy, you know, to support them, you know, through that, pro through that process. So for us, I mean, we've identified three key themes that we want to focus on. Uh, and that's aligned to the challenges, you know, that we face uh, in South Africa, which is uh, growth. Um, and for that, you know, we all need uh, job creation. So job creation, reduced inequalities and climate. And climate, uh, you know, climate and jobs, you know, some may see as, you know, opposing themes, you know, to try and, and implement. But we really feel that we cannot develop economically, you know, leaving the social aspect behind. You know, economies have to develop both social and economic outcomes that are sustainable, you know, for the country to help us re reduce the, the wealth gap in the country. And I mean, to give you a basic example, and we all know that unemployment is stubborn, you know, uh, in the mid thirties in our country for a very long time. We need growth. Um, the world inflation is facing, uh, you know, uh, inflationary pressures, which puts even more pressure on us. But especially for, you know, for companies in South Africa, uh, you know, to produce sustainable uh, companies, what we need to provide is access to basic services, which is, which is basically shelter, water and electricity. Now, the imp impact of carbon, um, you know, on the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect makes it even more difficult, you know, for us to operate in our economy. And it exaggerates the inequalities, you know, that exist in our economy. So we're trying to come up with investments, um, you know, which is actually driven by, by our investors. You know, they're asking for investments that will provide both a social return and a commercial return. And we believe both are possible. Thanks, Anile. Note though, around the investors um, kind of looking for those returns that are also giving back to 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 the planet and also to society, and I guess that's where ESG comes from. Do, do you not find that there may potentially be an unintended consequence where we, as the continent of Africa, that lags in terms of um, greening our production processes and the like, mm -hmm. uh, almost almost having a chicken and egg situation that because we may not be using as clean, for example, as energy as we would like, that may disincentivize foreign investment into our economies and incentivize investment to more established economies, yet we are the ones that need it most. And also, to be fair, we are not necessarily the biggest cause because we are not as industrialized as, say, the US or China. Yeah, well, well Andila, actually, I mean, we, we're one of the largest carbon emitters in the world, right? And I think the world's recognized that. And that's why you see, you know, uh, developed nations, you know, pledging recently eight and a half billion towards South Africa's just transition, you know, based on our, our nationally determined contribution, you know, towards reducing carbon emissions uh, by 2050. So I think there is a lot of support, you know, globally, but I think the trick is going to be on how we implement it. I right. think public and private, you know, partnerships are essential to that. I think the, I mean, the numbers quoted are like something in the region of 250 billion that we would need, you know, by 2050 to yeah. uh, put, put in place sustainable, you know, infrastructure to meet our needs. So I don't think we're alone. Um, and I think there is sufficient capital, not sufficient capital in South Africa and globally, you know, to assist us in meeting okay. these, uh, these targets. All right. Bevan says there is sufficient capital both in country and abroad to help us meet these challenges. Big numbers, $250 billion potentially we would need as a continent to get there around 2050. Let me move on to you, Professor Loazi Ngobevana. You, you are the director of African at the African Energy Leadership Center at the Viz Business School. Um, tell us a little bit about the center and also your thoughts on this issue of jobs in the green economy. Thank you, Andile. Um, and uh, very good morning to my fellow panelists. Um, look, from the African Energy Leadership Center perspective, uh, our role 
uh, as a center is one to develop leaders uh, for the African energy uh, landscape. Um, we do know that Africa is energy poor, um, and this is something that uh, we have identified, you know, that the real challenge is, is leadership. Um, you know, we, we do have solutions, technical solutions, however, um, the leadership is what's failing us. So our role is to try and develop uh, future leaders who can tackle the, you know, the big challenge of, of the energy trilemma, really, uh, which is, you know, around security, equity, and sustainability, um, which is pretty much what we're talking about today. Of course, um, you know, one of the legs that we stand on uh, as the ELC uh, is doing research, uh, and this is to ensure that uh, we can come up with innovative solutions. Um, we're talking, you know, different business models, um, you know, to ensure that we can deliver energy to, to the continent. And, and one of the big things we also do uh, as the ELC is thought leadership. Uh, and this is primarily based on, on the research that we conduct. Um, to ensure that we can be part of the conversation, in fact, try and lead the conversation uh, on issues around energy um, and, and try and influence energy, energy policy, uh, you know, in the country and, and, and on the continent as a well, whole, uh, because we think that, you know, it, it's very important um, that we have all of society involved uh, in making decisions. We don't just leave uh, this to, you know, political and or even business leaders. Of course, it's very important uh, if we're talking energy transition um, that we talk uh, around the issue of partnerships, uh, you know, both the pri private sector and, and the public sector. And and has already alluded to that, um, that we need uh, to ensure that we have these partnerships. Because I see that one of the big challenges uh, is, is that, you know, we are in a situation where we have to decarbonize as a continent um, and yet we are energy poor. Uh, we've got energy resources in fossil fuels uh, that we are in some corners being, I suppose, almost uh, herded into a corner um, that we, we need to almost abandon them. Now, this is problematic on many, on many levels because when you talk equity, for example, um, you cannot speak equity and, and uh, energy access and energy security um, if you are going to say your only focus um, is, is only on green energy. Now, we have to, as I think as the ALC, make sure that we play a role in ensuring that our conversations are level-headed, uh, discussions are not uh, driven by ideologies, uh, that they're driven by the numbers. So job security is a big issue, you know, that, that comes up, of course, uh, when, when you talk uh, energy transition. But of course, you know, the environment is, is without a doubt uh, a big, big, big issue. And, and our role is to make sure that uh, we, we drive the conversation to say, let's be pragmatic in our approaches. Um, let's look at the green economy as, as you know, as opportunity uh, for growth, as opportunity for, um, for innovation uh, to ensure that we can provide energy security. But energy security being uh, sort of our North Star, uh, if I can put it that way. Because without energy security, we will not grow our economies. Um, we will not create jobs. We will not ensure sustainability uh, without energy security. So that really is our perspective, uh, that we need to have a pragmatic approach, uh, but also, like I said, you know, ensure that um, the, the green economy is seen as a catalyst uh, for innovation, the catalyst for new industries, uh, yeah. to ensure uh, that we can transition, transition uh, yeah, to, to a greener future. Loise, on that note of uh, energy security, here we are all logging in electronically and all, you know, partly worried we might be cut off at any moment this morning. Uh, we're all looking at our watches and looking at our apps to make sure we stay online. You talk about a perspective being primarily energy security and almost then we can talk about all the other issues because we live in a continent that is energy poor, to use your language. In summary, how do we solve that? How do you get to a state where, when you ask for Professor Loazi Ngobevana's perspective, he says, we are now energy secure. How do we get there? <laughs> well, first, I think it's important that we define what energy security means for, for the country. Um, is, is it that we got energy to drive industries? Or does it mean uh, we've got energy 
you know, to drive industry and the home and and, and all other business. Um, so I think that that's really the starting point. I think the second thing as well uh, that's also very important in, in this conversation is what does a just energy transition look like? So, uh, you know, it, it will look different, uh, I dare say, for someone in Bumalanga, uh, you know, in Malakini, and, and someone in, um, I don't know, in, in the Northern Cape, some, you know, um, what that future is going to look different. So we need to define what that looks like um, and, and the path that's going to lead us, you know, to a, trans a transition future in terms of our energy. So, did you well, just reference Malakini and Northern Cape on the basis that I could have a job in a in a coal business in a Malakini, but I could also have a job in a renewable energy plant in in the Northern Cape? Absolutely, and and I think we we, we should not be you know uh, in a world of dichotomies where we say you must do one or the other. Um, I think it's a question of, like I said, you know, define what that looks like for us as a country, defining what that looks like for, you know, specific regions and areas, um, because a, a job lost, um, you know, in in the Western Cape uh, may not be, you know, recovered in the Western Cape. Uh, it might have to be recovered in Limpopo or, or something yeah. like that, you know. So we need to define what that's going to look like, and we need to think what that's going to do to our communities. Um, yeah. You know, because now we're going to, you know, have people sort of displaced. We're going to have uh, yeah. changes in, in in the jobs that people do and the skill set that they have. Um, so I think it's very important that we start with those definitions on what energy security is, and secondly, what a just um, energy future looks like. Now, once we've defined what those look like, um, yeah. I think then we start to look and say, okay, so what are the you know, practical steps that we can take in the green economy. So let's say um, we're talking, let's say green hydrogen as, as an yeah. example, right? If we decide as a country that green hydrogen is what we want to produce, we then identify also what in the value chain, um, you know, what, what is in the value chain of green hydrogen? Um, you know, are we talking water, for example? So how are we going to produce, or how are we going to get water? We might have to go desalination, now that's the whole industry we be developing right there. Uh, we need, uh, let's say we're gonna drive it, let's keep it simple and say solar. Where are we gonna get our solar energy from? Right, um, we need solar panels, uh, we need battery storage and all of those things. Now we start to look and say, what industries do we need to set up to make sure that we can provide the entire value chain? And this is where all of these innovations are going to come as well. Um, and then, yeah, and, and then we then say, okay, We've now got all of these. We produce this green hydrogen. We're going to sell it. Where are we going to build these projects? Uh, what you know, project development skills do we need? Um, what operating skills do we need? So we identify all of those, and and this is where we're really going to start to make a difference. Absolutely, absolutely, and I guess it talks to policy as well. I've already made absolutely. the note that you know, a missing member of this panel is is government. You know, it'd be very interesting to see what does our national policy say around the points that uh, that you're making was. Thank you for your input. Let me move on to Mr. Skosana. Mr. Skosana is the acting executive at the TIA. He looks after innovation and enabling. Quickly, Skosana, on the work you guys are doing around enabling innovation, especially around the green e economy, and this tricky matter of uh, jobs in the green economy. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Anil. Uh, uh, thanks to my fellow colleagues. I think they've made fairly good opening remarks and they connect well uh, uh, to the mandate of the organization. You know, as we, 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 we adopt these green economy initiatives and, and, and uh, uh, requiring uh, new technologies, to be honest, uh, we'll need to, to look forward in making sure that uh, innovations uh, in these uh, innovation value chains are supported very well. But just to set context, because you've asked a question, where is the government? Yeah, so uh, there's one uh, level that government will function, and I call it uh, setting uh, 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 the issue of, of ministries, level two of, of where the Department of Science and Innovation plays, having been advised uh, uh, by various advisory panel. But there's a third level where the agency plays. We 
we see ourselves as an implementing partner for, for government and hence we implement initiatives driven by the Department of Science and Technology. So in context of ways the government, they've set the policies, we position ourselves to, to respond to those policies and, and actually implement those policies within science, engineering and technology landscape. But uh, as we do that, we need to understand that there are researchers, uh, there are people who undertake innovations, mainly at the universities and science council. Uh, we, we think that they are well embedded in what TIA does. And hence, when, when we talk about the mandate of TIA, beyond just uh, being an active funder, uh, we connect these uh, le levels of, of our country, we facilitate uh, and, and, and interact with them, most importantly, we also provide services. You, we use the concept of a quadruple helix approach where we say even our communities matter in undertaking this way. So if one was to say, what is the role of TIA? We want to strengthen the national system of innovation to make sure that, you know, as we build synergies within science, industrial policy is carbon board. You cannot separate science and technology innovation policies and leave industrial policies. I'm happy that the conversation today has a fair balance around that. But the most critical thing that I hope I'll emphasize in our conversation is the issue of call it skills, education. You know, how do we bring forward the curriculum development that can be able to respond to frontier technologies? When we go to, to green economy, as we transit, we'll need to look at skills development as part of our approach. Otherwise, we'll leave a lot of our communities behind. One of the focus areas that most countries are doing is to make sure that no one is left behind. Uh, so TIA is at the heart of, of the, and I'm going to use the word triple A, you know, uh, is this the knowledge available? Is it affordable? Uh, are we aware? Because some of our communities are not aware what is happening. Are we transiting? When is the next power plant going to be decommissioned? is the ability actually uh, to, to, as we introduce this green uh, uh, renewable solution, is the ability for them to be utilized effectively. Uh, we know that there's a digital gap, uh, you know, some populations, 65% of uh, some of the developing countries uh, population doesn't have uh, capabilities to adopt digital solutions. So for me, skills development will be critical as we transit. And I'll discuss a little bit around what we are doing around skills development because we know that uh, uh, the issue of infrastructure is also at the heart. The R&D capabilities and industry inclusiveness uh, is key. So for us, it's uh, uh, bringing all role players within the ecosystem to, you know, when we, we want to ad adapt and adopt a green economy, the required skills must be there. Is the issue of the readiness, you know. Uh, out of the, the, the 158 countries, if you look at the the, the, the BRICS countries, 54 uh, uh, position. That's where South Africa is. You know, are we ready to, to adapt? So that, those are some of the questions that we must have. Our, our plants need to be repurposed, need to be repowered. Uh, so we, we can't leave no one behind. And, and our technical vocational education training facilities need to be kept up to rest on what needs to be done for, for the future. Uh, so th those are the things I hope we will look at because for me, is the issue of readiness more than anything else. And our role and mandate as TIA, we want to make sure that the country is ready to transit uh, when we adopt these uh, green economies. The issue of readiness is Mr. Skosana's biggest issue here. All right, let me move on to Mr. Malembe Mtweni, he's the acting senior manager, responsible for the incubation network at the Small Enterprise Development Agency. No doubt, small businesses, Mr. Mtweni, have a big role to play here. Talk a little bit about the programs you guys have got going to support small businesses as we manage our way through this just transition. Thank you, Mr. Kumalo. Um, <clears throat> as CEDA, I think many people don't understand and sometimes you take for granted that people understand who CEDA is and some uh, mistake us for being CETA. And But uh, CEDA is a small enterprise development agency which is an agency of the Department of Small Business Development. CEDA was established in December in 2004 through the National Small Business Act, Act number 29 of 2004. It is managed by, it is mandated to implement government small business strategy, design and implement a standard and common national delivery network 
for small enterprise development and integrate government funded small enterprise support agencies across all tiers through the country. So in short, that was CEDA is, we, 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 we are responsible for all the small businesses in the country. Uh, we are the go-to organization when small business needs support. So how does CEDA do that? We do it through our offerings and our services that we provide to actually support the small businesses. The incubation footprint, as we speak today, uh, Mr. Mdungwa, we've got about 120 incubators nationally, which actually support the small businesses and they're all sector specific. Now, <clears throat> today's topic about the green economy couldn't have come at a better time. Judging by what we're experiencing, I think we're in uh, stage six of uh, load shedding and stuff like that. And recently we've just uh, seen the devastating floods in KZN. All talks to that, what we are actually with my colleagues on the panel discuss about. And CEDA's role is to actually strengthen this incubation and network so that it's able to support the small SMMEs that are playing a crucial role in creating jobs. And they become sustainable because they're incubated and they get all the services. Now, <clears throat> as, 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 I, um, as I'm speaking now, we've got a renewable energy incubator in Atlantis in the Western Cape called Sarebi, South African Renewable Energy Business Incubator. This incubator is incubating a number of small businesses that are actually responding to this call of how do we grow this green economy? So in that incubator, you'll find the incubatees, the, the small businesses where which we call incubatees that are, are, are designing and producing smart meters. You'll find those who are actually uh, building and manufacture solar water geysers. You'll find those who are also creating and installing embedded energy generation and solar panels. And those are building uh, components to the solar panels and sell it to the people who are now building the solar panels. Up and above that, uh, CEDA has got a division that deals with what we call conformity assessments which talks to standards and quality. Now, the small businesses will come to CEDA and say, I'm manufacturing these uh, solar water geysers. How can CEDA support me? We'll say then, we will fund for you at SABS to get your geysers certified by SABS. Right. Because by law, they need to be certified. So, we then have an agreement with the South African Bureau of Standards, whereby these SMMEs will go and submit their products to SABS and get tested, and in return, CEDA pays SABS on their behalf. Also, we are partnering with different departments. In the past few years, because the green economy thing is not a new thing, it's been with us for quite a few years already. So the Department of Tourism approached us as CEDA and said, CEDA, how can we collaborate and look at um, our, our hotels and BNBs in terms of water efficiency and how we can save water? And we worked with the South African Bureau of Standards to come up with a standard, which is known as a SANS 1162. It's a standard for responsible tourism where these facilities are geared to say, um, they use a lot of water, but they can save water again because they do a lot of laundry, they do a lot, there's a lot of people that are taking bath and showers. Instead of just flushing that water away, you use the same water, which we say gray water, to flush the toilets and also to water the gardens in, in, in the hotels and BNBs and those facilities. So that on its own created a lot of jobs for plumbers, if you look at it that way. And it's our firm belief that uh, the green economy creates more opportunities than uh, what people think. 
as much as now we're sitting with this um, lot of plans of ESCOM, there are still opportunities. Right as I'm talking to you now, we are supporting small businesses that are contracted by uh, ESCOM to sample what we call stack emission. To say at any given time, they will go to this uh, ESCOM plants and sample the air emission to, to, to assess whether um, the, the emissions that uh, ESCOM releases to the air are still within the limits, the carbon limits as regulated by ACT to say what limits are they, are, 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 are they producing. Uh, contrary to the normal belief, to, 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 to the public belief that uh, ESCOM is just releasing a lot of carbon, there is an act that, uh, an, an allowable limit to say so much carbon can be released at any given time. So these SMMEs, we support them by actually uh, affording them the necessary equipment in their laboratories and also assisting assisting them to get the accredita accreditation by SANAS on 17025, which is a lab laboratory techniques. Yeah. So th th those are the all supports that that right. that we 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 we, we really uh, support the current industries and also migrating to the future industries that are totally uh, carbon free and to reduce the carbon footprint. Thank you very much for that, sir, because it really creates a great backdrop for us to have the conversation around what, what, what Professor Razi was saying earlier on is a definition. We need to define what just is. I don't have a definition, but I do think that the conversation around jobs um, or work opportunities and the green economy is worth having. That's why we're all here. So let me pose the, the fundamental question to all of you around does the green economy create jobs? Does the green economy kill jobs? What is the net effect? Is the net effect more job or is it let, net effect less jobs? Or is it a timing issue? In the short term, it may be one thing and maybe in the long term another. And in the middle of that, a point raised by Vusi earlier, what then becomes the requirement around skills? How do we make sure we take advantage of those opportunities? Mervyn, let me start with you in your own observation with all the work you guys do from a capital allocation perspective, yeah. does the green economy, does going green not end up being at odds with reducing inequality and therefore jobs? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Anile. So I, I think it's very important to acknowledge that, um, you know, as uh, Luazi said, that if we shut down the coal industry, we're going to lose 125,000 jobs overnight. You know, for energy security, we can't do that for... For the state of our economy and maintaining, you know, whatever standards we have now, we it's it's just not possible to do. So I think I think what Loazi talked about, you know, this just transition, I think needs a lot of thought because families are gonna be uh are gonna be moved uh you know from from the you know from the places of 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 living for, for long periods of time, you know, probably generations and you and you'll know that the most stressful thing that can happen to anybody is moving house, um, you know, let alone moving, you know, moving provinces. And so, so I think it needs, it needs a lot of careful consideration, but the research we have seen, you know, states that we can produce actually about three times the, the number of jobs that we'll lose, uh, you know, through, through transitioning, you know, th from, from coal to, to renewables. So we're quite confident, you know, we're quite confident that, you know, as Prof has said as well, that there'll be many opportunities, you know, many new opportunities um, for which we will definitely need to upskill people, you know, as well. And it will, and I think we must, we must use this as an opportunity to create higher standards of living for people, you know, across our, uh, our country, you know, to try and reduce that, that wealth gap and to try and get that energy security and, uh, you know, the supply of basic services for especially SMEs who I think are going to be the engine room of our economy, you know, in creating jobs. So I think, you know, this just transition is incredibly important for us. You know, the funding that we receive, you know, from international donors, you know, hopefully will be uh, directed mostly towards, um, you know, towards communities where we can upskill people and we can relocate them safely into communities that produce a higher standard of living you know, for them.
Mervyn, you made a point earlier on, though, about potentially over 100,000 jobs being lost if, for example, tomorrow we said no more coal. Yet I'm seeing some of your colleagues in the finance world making announcements such as we will no longer fund any fossil fuel projects beyond 2020X. Yeah. For me, that sounds like it may end up exactly where you most fear, where capital is no longer going to certain industries because you know the trend is to move in, in, in one side. How do you make sure that's just if people are making such pronouncements? Yeah, I, th- I think I think it's not possible. It, it's not possible, you know, for where we stand as an economy, you know, not to not to have a path towards, uh, you know, adaptation and mitigation, you know, in, cli- in climate. So I think I think as long as those companies, you know, can show us a path, you know, towards producing, um, you know, to- towards uh, you know a green economy and 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 renewables, I think we have to support them. Because I don't think we can afford losing more jobs, you know, in, okay. in our economy, especially, you know, especially at this, you know, at this point in time. So I think for, for us, what's more important is engagement. Um, you know, engagement with these companies who, you know, yeah. who are invested in uh, carbon intensive uh, uh, industries and to, and to plot with them the path, you know, towards a greener future, you know, for our okay. country. Lovely, interested in your view on this one. Lie of the land. Can we create more jobs? Clearly the green economy can. Can it lose jobs? Clearly there might be some jobs at risk. There is a timing issue. There's a skills issue. Where do you see the solutions? Yeah, um, I think to echo Melvin, uh, I think it's very important that firstly we have the conversation, you know, with all the players, or really all the stakeholders, and, and define what a just energy transition looks like. Uh, what that path is going to look like, how long it's going to take us to get to a, a carbon or less carbon intensive economy. Now, can the green economy create more jobs uh, than, than the coal sector at the moment? Well, it certainly can, but I think it depends on how we do it. So if, for example, we go on the path of importing technology, uh, importing skills, then we are creating a problem. Uh, we're going to lose more than we're going to gain. But if we go on the path, as I mentioned earlier, of saying we are going to develop, uh, you know, the value chains from within the country, uh, we're going to industrialize. We're going to see the green economy as an opportunity to industrialize. And we're going to see this as an opportunity to develop skills. Um, you know, TVETs, universities, uh, universities of technologies, uh, all need to come together as well. We identify what kind of skill sets are going to be needed, you know, for, for a greener future. And, and we start developing those skills. Uh, we need, you know, the DFIs, for example, to come out and say, look, we're going to put um, our money where our mouth is and, and we're going to support, um, you know, FMNEs, uh, you know, to make sure that they, they get, they play a role uh, in, in a growing or in growing the, the green economy. I think that way uh, we'll then be able to, you know, to create jobs. If we keep the skills local, if we keep uh, the value chains in, in you know, in, in its entirety uh, local, and uh, we develop right. industries around the green economy, then we'll create more jobs uh, than we lose. I, I want to quote from the report I mentioned earlier on, the United Nations ILO report, Loazi. Uh, uh, it says, and of course, it's talking about developed economies here. It says a mere percent <laughs> of the workforce in industrialized countries, for example is employed in the 10 to 15 industries that are generating 70 to 80% of CO2 emissions. So to revise those numbers, eight to 12% of the workforce works in businesses that emit 70 to 80% of the CO2 emissions. And then it goes ahead and says, only a fraction of these is likely to lose their jobs if policies are adopted to green existing enterprises and to promote employment. The argument they're making is, yes, there'll be some job losses, but don't worry. It's not that big. Um, and in any event, what the green economy will do will create even more jobs. Now, do you think the picture is different for, for, for our kind of world, which is not industri- fully industrialized or fully developed? Or do you think, ah, maybe we're making a mountain out of a molehill? There'll be some casualties of war um, and a few battles, but in the fullness of time, we shall be victorious. Well, my simple, I mean, simple retort to that is South Africa is sitting with what, over 40% unemployment to begin with. 
And, and if you're going to put 100,000 odd people, and those are the direct jobs, by the way. Uh, you know, we, we haven't spoken about, you know, all the indirect jobs uh, from, you know, the coal industry. Uh, so we see our picture is very different, uh, which is why for me it's very important that we own the conversation. Uh, we decide what's going to work for us and how we're going to do it. Uh, we cannot simply plug and play, you know, models that, that have worked elsewhere. I mean, well, typical example, um, you know, even before the crisis in, in, in Ukraine and Russia, Germany, for example, had their uh, electricity prices skyrocketing, right? But for the German uh, society, those prices, they're going high because, you know, they're transitioning, they shut down their coal mines, they shut down their nuclear and, and they start importing uh, their electricity. But the citizens could afford that. Um, but in a South African situation, if you're now suddenly going to shut down ESCOM, I mean, as bad as it is now, uh, but it's still keeping the economy alive, you know, to, to some extent. Now, if you're going to suddenly shut that's gone down, where, where's this, you know, where, where's South Africa is going to get money to, to pay for electricity that perhaps is imported? Maybe we need now need to get more electricity from uh, Mozambique, or, you know, uh, to, to go green. Because as things stand, in South African context, I mean, you look at our renewable energy capacity or electricity, let, let me say, we're talking six, seven gigawatts installed, but when we need it the most, it's currently not available. In its current form, it's not able to give us, you know, those six, seven gigawatts. Um, so we cannot, you know, make the argument that, right. you know, uh, it's only a few jobs. Yeah. It won't work not for us. Not, not for us. <laughs> Fuzi, let me come to you because a cynical view could be, you know, you South Africans are having this conversation uh, you know, in, in a little bubble, you know, you sound like a chamber here because it's not really your choice. Innovation is a global phenomenon. If you don't choose whether we're going to be innovative alone or not, the world is moving green. Um, you know, we, we have to keep up. So it's not really, some might say, a choice for us. Or do we shut it down? Do we not? In time, the world is moving to more green solutions. We will decarbonize one way or the other. And therefore, we may have to face the realities of potentially losing some jobs and then take on the responsibility of creating the new jobs. Where does innovation fit in here? Yeah. So, so one, one can always uh, uh, look at innovation as a, a matter of maybe looking at a new niche areas. You know, how do we bring renewables, bioeconomy, uh, and, and so forth. But for me, it's also looking at how do we uh, look at uh, renewable energy allocations, you know, because this is a, it's an energy mix. Uh, and as we transit, we need to look at how that uh, energy mix allocation is looked at, such that uh, we bring in the communities and society. Uh, in some areas, we might need to, to repurpose and, and repower. Uh, just only uh, 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 last month, we we, we accompanied uh, ESCOM and uh, the COP26 presidential delegations to Komati Power Station, mm -hmm. where we're exhibiting uh, uh, two demonstrating pilot in those facilities uh, to keep the communities active. Uh, those are grassroots innovations coming from those communities to say, this is what we want to do in our area, uh, making sure that uh, the, the energy transition does not really destroy those communities. So the strategy to transit is critical, but uh, however, uh, uh, the world is going on, and we we've made it a clear decision in the organization that uh, we will we will lead uh, with with our uh, glo global clean tech solutions. Uh, we, we are launching a call uh, where we invite uh, SMEs with innovative clean solutions uh, that can help in combating climate change, lowering the green gas uh, emissions. Uh, this is a, a, a call that purely based on looking at new startup, emerging startups. Uh, that will be supported. It's not just about the technology. Uh, you also need to get the right quality jockey. And, and this program is trying to look at uh, looking at the technology and also putting them on a, a one-year program, making sure that the new startups start to participate. It's a global program uh, implemented with, with UNIDO where we will uh, end in a competition base. The launch of, of this will be done at uh, COP26 later in November uh, in Egypt. We can't be left behind. We need to participate in the global world yeah. as we transit. So 
uh, we, we can't uh, be, be seen as lagging behind. We need to find ways of, of catching up, but we need to se select the correct niche areas. As we uh, select those niche areas, they must be linked with our capabilities in creating the right skills to be able to implement uh, those uh, solutions and technologies. Innovation on its own is not effective. It needs to talk to the communities and also yeah. have the right platforms to, to implement it. It's talking of skills though, um, uh, Malembe, you know, as an entrepreneur myself and the amount of time I spend with SMEs, you know, we are motivated, stimulated, uh, driven by economic opportunity, right? And renewable energy in, in, in a very big way has become a big economic opportunity. And we've seen, we've seen many a small business person get involved in it and take on the opportunity. But often I find that we don't often pay attention to our skills, right? We, we chase the money, but we don't often think about the skills that I need in order for me to not only start a business, but to be able to grow it. And now you're running all these incubation programs. Well, what's the uptake? Are SMEs, are entrepreneurs, realizing and being one with the fact that they need to upskill themselves to best take advantage of what the green economy can provide in terms of economic opportunity. And what kind of successes have you seen insofar as incubating for upskilling? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumalo. <clears throat> you, you are right. Um, I think most of the time we, we undermine the skill that is there, the inherent skill that these SMMEs have. Um, you get to understand when you start to see what they're producing. So what these incubators are doing, as I said earlier on, they are sector specific. Yeah. They, they, they will hone the skills on the technical side and also at the same time on the commercial and business side so that the whole small enterprise is developed holistically, uh, not only be a technocrat in terms of uh, what is required or what is producing, but also the business and commercial side to say, for me, with this knowledge, how can I then grow my business and, 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 and increase um, employment in my own businesses? We've seen that with a smart exchange, which is in Durban, which is in the outsourced businesses, which are call centers, where those people will find one SMME that now is is actually employing more than 100 people. So it's a it's, 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 it's starting number of these things that you see. So, and again, coming back to what uh, uh, my, 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 my panelists have been uh, talking to, at this point in time, really we cannot afford even to, to lose jobs, not even a single job. So as much as we, we were worried about the carbon footprint, but, uh, naturally, the natural attrition will actually respond to that, whereby as the green economy grows to a point where it will render um, the, 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 the carbon producing uh, uh, industries irrelevant. Let me give you a classical example. Hmm. You remember the post office when it still had uh, services like uh, telegrams selling post postal stamps and things like that, yeah. technology grew and it advances where it rendered sending telegrams obsolete. Yeah. But did the government shut down the post office? No. Instead, the post office is responding to the new emerging technologies. So this is what's going to happen. We don't have to shut down any uh, 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 enterprise or any business, but the natural growth of the green economy will, will, will make it, Got you. render it uh, 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 irrelevant, and they'll have to now respond and say, how, what do we res how, how do you respond to this emerging market with what we have? Got you. Thank you. Got you. Got you loud and clear, Melinda. Quick one on the money, Mervyn and Vusi. Um, I have this innovation. I'm a small business. Um, now I need the capital. Now I need the capital to get my idea going. Because I often find that, you know, in the green economy, certainly when you look at the renewable energy model, uh, you know, as a former banker, the model works for itself, right? You uh, give you tons of money, you build a plant, you get energy, the offtake is as common. Not difficult to fund. 
but if I'm innovating something that um, Vusi and his colleagues have supported me in, and I now need capital to get it going, how do we get the money into the SMEs to get these innovations going for them to participate in the green economy? Because it's often something I hear spoken about. It's not often something that I see. Mervyn, let me start with you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I actually think that's uh, you know those opportunities that you know present themselves are going to be extremely important. I mean, during COVID, we saw so many small companies innovate, um, innovate actually around uh, around sustainability. You know, one of them was a um, you know a water business. You know, providing access to water for communities. You know, um, you know, around the mine. So I definitely think, you know, if there's a solid idea, if there's a solid idea, you know, with a good offtake and there's a market for it, it will, it will definitely be fundable. You know, and as um, as Vusi said, you know, uh, champion is also, you know, also very important in that, you know, in that, uh, in that space. But but we need organizations like CEDA, you know, to incubate these businesses, give them a bit of a track record. Uh, show that they're successful, so that they can become, um, so that they can become fundable, you know, by commercial capital. But I also think that, you know, in South Africa, we ha- we need we need a fundamental change in a thinking how we fund small businesses. You know, the typical you know banking models don't work. Uh, you know, where we ask for enormous amounts of security, you know, to get businesses you know off the ground. You know, that's why I think partnerships, you know, partnerships between um, between government or, or public sector capital can really, um, you know, accelerate and catalyze, you know, these investments into, into, into small right. businesses. Because our job is to mobilize capital, you know, from, yeah. from people who want to make a difference, but also want a commercial return with, with acceptable risk. So we need to find those mechanisms and they are available, you know, through blended finance structures and guarantees, you know where we can attract that capital uh, yeah. into into the sector to you know to provide those uh, access to capital for SMEs. Who sees the money flowing? Yeah, where to? That's a big question. <laughs> my, my where to? Yeah, yeah, that's a big question we need to answer. But my sense is that um, we we need to enable the traditional uh, production sectors to benefit uh, from this. New capital, uh, because you 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 know the saying: if you are in coal, don't don't even bother to to get into your flight in, in, to the Silicon Valley to be funded there. But if we look at the, the traditional uh, uh, production sectors and look at the knowledge you've produced, the uh, intellectual property that we have, patents, even uh, 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 matching our capabilities between uh, uh, the technology developers to work with the traditional production to enable a new and emerging uh, uh, spin-off uh, to be ready yeah. to track this uh, uh, capital investment. But also for, for TIA, we've made a clear decision that we will diversify our funding instrument. We are looking at uh, different funding instruments, industry matching fund. For example, we say industry, you bring one rent, we bring one rent, let's work together. Yeah. We go, we've also worked with government, uh, technology acquisition and deployment fund call it the first buyer of new technology. Uh, TIA has been uh, uh, given that draw to say, identify critical solutions and, 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 and technologies that promote service delivery. We cannot uh, uh, see energy as a, a, a not being a service delivery issue. That instrument says government will become the first buyer. We haven't tested, we haven't seen the technology, but uh, TIA will facilitate that we deploy those technologies to demonstrate right. Uh, the word is, you know, uh, uh, putting the, the skin in the game, how yeah. these SMEs are able to deliver in deploying this new solution. So uh, we need to look at how we, we match, call it the existing industries and emerging yeah. industries to work together and attract this uh, capital investment. But we need to look at alternative ways of doing things. We can't continue uh, the same way as we've done. So that's how we, 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 we invade the processes. We innovate the processes, not just the, the technology itself. We need to start doing things differently. Mervyn was talking about partnerships, we see, and I think there is one potential partnership between the capital allocators and the people like TIA who are closest to the innovations. If you're doing all this facilitation, you're playing this role of being first buyer, it might be an idea in the future to have your a fund that you manage on behalf of capital owners who are looking to to make investments into these because you would obviously know best.